Hello, Harja. I guess you're a mighty good person. Well, then you a grill on the cart line. Then here that granella shot the blue and the bellyish. Let me hear clear you, Han. I guess my whole yaki, Johnny Dillon. Hello, Johnny. Hi. How are you? You join myself and Johnny today, folks, as we step tentatively into the May edition of Blue and the Bellyish. This time last year, we would have been discussing May Day and the belief that the good folk, or Bonny the Grock, Nadini Mahi, Nadini Wishle, the fairy folk, were known to be particularly lively and active at this time of year as we mark the beginning of summer, stealing away our milk profit for the year or cattle and such like. But their thieving ways do not stop there, for we know that the good folk are drawn to all beautiful things, so we're probably safe enough there, Johnny. Well. And what can be more beautiful than a fresh faced, smiling Bonnie Bairn or a baby? Fresh from the oven. Our Irish narrative, I always cook my own, Johnny. Our Irish narrative legends, alongside our rich tradition of European migratory legends, abound with sample stories detailing the theft of human babies by the fairy folk and the replacement with a sickly, ill thriven fairy substitute, commonly referred to as changelings, the focus of today's podcast. The incursion of the supernatural otherworld into our own was an all too familiar risk for our forebears and one which demanded proactive strategies for the protection of one's family. This fearful changeling belief then is found in various forms throughout the whole of Northern Europe and in the East the belief extends to the Carpathians and to Northern and Western Russia we're told. And although less prevalent outside of Europe, certain samples have been mooted as far afield as Africa, Asia, China, Japan and even Australia. Such legends reflect then very real human fears and desires, and although they are often cast in humorous, colourful robes, these stories conceal much darker hidden threads, hinting at childhood illness, deformity and disability, marital stress, parental pressure, social strain. My alliteration again, I'm obsessed. Amazing. Honestly, I've only noticed this recently. <laughs> As with all our podcasts... You have pod- a problem. <laughs> Do you have a problem? My name's Claire Duhan and I have a literation problem. <laughs> Um, as with all our podcast subjects, Johnny and I like to get beneath the skin of these popular beliefs and move away from common misconceptions towards um, probably a more critical understanding of their function and place in traditional life. So we hope you'll come away from today's episode with a few surprising facts, as well as some useful tips and tools for all expectant mums and dads about how to keep the good folk from your door and more importantly, from your cradle. So to kickstart, we thought it might be useful to frame these changeling narratives within the broader genre framework first, I suppose, before looking at the stories themselves and talk a little about why it is that we call them legends as opposed to folk tales or fairy tales and how they then come to be identified as migratory legends. Mm. So I might hand you over to the guru Mm, for all things theoretical and we'll start um, ranting about this. Yes, yes. Um, Well, where to start? I suppose... One of the things maybe to look at to, to for listeners to refresh their memories, although it's something that we spoke about in, I think it was the sixth podcast with the mm. fairy, the fairy forts, whatever, um, is to kind of, in thinking about the fairies, to remove from your idea, from your, from your mind, the ideas of them as being these kind of, um, kind of effeminate, literary, Tinkerbell type, floating light kind of figures, because that's not how they feature in, in folk tradition. That's a, that's a kind of later Victorian uh, literary um, incarnation, for want of a better word, really, or way of kind of um, expressing them, whatever. But the fairies, I suppose, in folk tradition, manifest more so as a kind of, as you were saying, Eric, as a site of the supernatural disorder that interrupts people's everyday, uh, interrupts the everyday, basically, mm-hmm. in people's lives in that way. And there's the fairy host, who are the kind of the large, um, anonymous kind of mass of this other world race that live alongside us at all times and they have their own leaders and their own competitions and own funerals and all, all sorts of stuff but within that kind of within the context of, of uh, fairy faith or fairy belief you have these solitary figures so the banshee is like a solitary kind of fairy figure in that context or the leprechaun would be another kind of much maligned or stereotype one in a sense but who has a, a solid basis in folk tradition as well and the changeling is another instance where these are kind of solitary figures that feature in narrative accounts where they're the sole kind of um, agent in a way. You don't have narratives really where a banshee, a leprechaun and a changeling walk into a bar as such per se kind of thing. That, that These narratives are, are separate. And they're legends in the sense, as opposed from folk tales, uh, the Brothers Grimm would have kind of divided these as Sagan and, and Merkin, where um, the, the legend is... I suppose it's a, it's a a narrative account first and foremost that has some aspect or component of belief attached to it. You can't you can't unlike the folk tale. Mm. So the Cinderella or Jack and the Beanstalk long ago far away kind Once of enter, a time. exactly these long multi-episodic kind of narratives or heroic tales or epic kind of cycles and these things. 
whereas the legend is much more immediate it's much more localized it's rooted in in um I suppose historicity it's rooted in the local area it's rooted in the sense of um say you know Cromwell tied his horse to this tree 600 years ago and something happened there at that point it's rooted in an immediate kind of space it kind or, of has a time a place and a person exactly yeah a, a place world of sorts where you have a kind of um it, it's attached to, to specific place names or specific people often a legend as well in the modern context a type of narrative that's when it's kind of oh a friend of a friend told me that this this thing happened that's that's often how a legend is framed so that when you're reciting it you don't know that you're um that you're reciting or giving an account of a traditional legend because there's an aspect of belief attached to it so even if you don't personally believe what's being described you can't but suggest that somebody else in a way did believe it that there's there's some aspect of belief tied to it um and where does the aspect of the memorat come in the memorat is a first person um account a first person legend so as opposed to say um a a legend in a sense where it's kind of this happened to claire's doctors babysitters friends pet cat said this mm. to me and um, the memory is i was coming home this one night and and this happened to me so it's it's that sort of an account whatever but it's still within this um it still expresses the motifs of this particular legend as opposed to being a totally personalized and specific kind of uh, anecdote or whatever that's totally individualized like an individual's ghost story or something like that where you can, they ca- kind of can't be classified almost that there are so many versions and um, so the legend I suppose follows a set framework it's often it's it's rooted in, in local area and place it happened at this place in this town or, or my town or whatever so there's a specific place name there's often a specific time attached to it or a specific family or a particular people and there's an element of, of belief attached to a legend um and then writer Christiansen the great um, Norwegian scholar he he compiled this list of the migratory legends and so when he kind of developed this system in, in tandem with other scholars and looking around at these different types of legends that shared i suppose they had, they had a a broad geographic spread and so you'd have maybe a legend surrounding say the changeling um but it, it would feature in the traditions of Ireland of England of Cornwall of Wales um of Scotland of Normandy, Picardy, North, Northern Northern France, um the Baltic region so Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia and so on. Um like you're saying the Carpathians, the Slovakia and all that sort of stuff over to Russia. So you could have these narratives and you could trace oh look that this narrative has, has migrated all over this portion of northwestern Europe or or it's come from you know there's some early Indo-European motif in this or that story or whatever. It's kind of this historic geographic kind of method where you plot a narrative spread over time and space. So the migratory legends are those legends that are shared across different nations and different peoples where they've they've spread um the same narrative kind of motifs largely have spread and are found in in different countries they make they jump over geographic divides like lakes or mountains or oceans and they jump through linguistic divides from Irish to English or you know whatever Cornish yeah. German etc etc and they they adapt to the environment that they find themselves Always. in slightly don't they which is Always. interesting because you see specifically Irish versions yeah. and we'll come to this where Seamus McPhillip speaks about changeling legends and the versions that are distinctly Irish mm. and the motif that we have that might not have translated elsewhere mm-hmm. so that's always curious i think for scholars yeah depending the on where they're and working. that's it gets worth bearing in mind as well in the context of what folk tradition is and why it functions and the the sense that it adapts to its immediate environment mm-hmm. all the time and if something if something doesn't fit the immediate environment then it stops existing there uh because it, it just it doesn't it doesn't suit so um but i suppose yeah so for people to to think that first of all to bear in mind that when we talk about the fairies we're not talking about uh, victorian kind of um pleasant little floating lights that, at the bottom of the garden having tea whatever it's a more uh, not necessarily evil but a disruptive and frightening force that manifests uh, i suppose into that flashes into the into the everyday where you have this other world kind of community of of um spirits living alongside us all the time who can help or hinder they can they can cause death or injury but they can they can uh, benefit humans as well and so on so Uh, and with, and within the context of the fairy host there are solitary figures solitary fairies as it were um, of whom the changeling is one and attached to whom is is an enormous kind of corpus of of belief and and lore basically so um again some of which is specific to this country but often is shared all over europe really and it's very popular up to the, to the last I suppose into the early 20th century at least there would frighteningly been. so and mm. we'll come to see how long it did last mm mm-hmm. and the havoc it caused mm. tragically mhm to me Bridget Cleary and sort of stuff or 
She's the most, the, the most well-known, but really it's one of these subjects. The more I read about this, I told you this during the week, it's one of the saddest podcasts I've prepared for mm, in a way. Dark. It is very dark. It's one of those narratives that we absorbed as children. There's one of the quotes I came across was um, kind of in terms of function and social context for these changing legends. Um, Dr. Garage O'Crulia wrote, Stories mm. of fairy abduction and its consequences are now being revealed as coded discourse concerning such matters as postnatal depression, child mm. and marital abuse, sexual nonconformity and psychic disturbances. Mm. So beneath all this, and we'll just kind of proceed now into a synopsis mm -hmm. for, for anyone who hasn't perhaps heard a traditional changeling legend, but you're looking at this surface legend but also now thinking critically about what it represents or what belief it manifests in it. Yeah. So to bear that in mind, and hopefully we'll unpack some of that as we go through it. Mm. So is it worth just giving a brief overview of Definitely. what a changeling narrative yes. looks like and the key components for those who might not have heard yeah. um, about it? So shall I just jump in? Over, give you a yeah, few yeah. Lines? So we start off with a tale. Now, again, as Johnny said, these will vary slightly, although they're quite stable in the key components, depending on where you find them manifesting in tradition, that there might be slight differences. But on the whole, you've got a healthy newborn baby in a family situation where they are then left unattended by a parent, whether the parent is forced to go out to work or to kind of take care of some chores around the homestead. And then the we come back to find the baby in an altered state where, and they're often described, we'll discuss this more about their appearance of the changeling, the wizened face, the long teeth, the enlarged head, lengthened limbed um, or lengthened limbs. You've got descriptions of beards and this funny kind of spasms and these strange movements. And the parent becomes aware that this is not my child. In other instances, there will be the aspect of this change being discovered by a babysitter or, well, I say a babysitter, it's usually a stranger or a, a tailor, a, a visitor to the house, not your, what is it, MTV Babysitter's Club. But um, so you'll have either the parent noticing or this external stranger noticing. And then it's the whole premise then becomes the job of confirming that it is a changeling and that it's not a human child. Mm -hmm. And this can be done in two ways. It can be done benignly by slight trickery where you try to trick the, cha the changeling into laughing or somehow confirming that it is a fairy substitute. But then more often than not in the tales, the methods of revealing the changeling's form is quite brutal and cruel, where they'll submit the changeling to fire or iron, they'll beat it, they'll leave it burn outside, it. they'll mm. burn it, they'll leave it outside um, to face exposure, they'll pour urine over it or they'll give drown it, it yeah drown it exactly even worse again they'll give it herbs and um, foxglove and certain herbs mm. that were known to um poisonous poison plants, yeah. kind of people but also changelings um and then douse them in water as you said kind of tragically drown them so <laughs> by this way the changeling will either reveal itself by fleeing up the chimney or out the window or disappear and then in certain cases the child miraculously returns it's never described how exactly it returns or where it comes from. And in other cases, there's actually no resolution and the child is never returned. Mm. And in some cases, rarely though, I, I believe, you have instances where the changeling is kept and lives with the family for 40 years or so and continues either to live benignly with them or torment them, torments them mm. as a burden on their economic well-being. So that's just a very, um, hopefully not too mangled overview of what a changeling mm. story is looks like and how it proceeds. Seamus and Philip said that it's, it's, a, it's a belief which has grown out of uh, deformations, diseases, abnormalities and untimely deaths mm. and there is kind of reference to infanticide and kind of child murder or congenital disorders and diseases and all that within it mm. but um, but yeah the basic premise is supposedly described is like this this supernatural race who replace a healthy child with this wizened mess of their own and it doesn't grow or it, it fails to thrive or it mm it's always crying and it's kind of no matter how much it eats it, it won't grow or it's if it's on its mother's breast it's, it's biting at her and mm -hmm. stuff like that there's all these kind of um um kind of i suppose dark images attached to it really but but a hugely common um idea i suppose we can look at different aspects of the the uh, the, the the motifs that lead to its identification as well and, mm -hmm. and how it's banished ultimately mm -hmm. um i have a piece I'll describe here, from, this is from Barney O'Hagan in County Down, this was recorded in 1951 uh, and he's talking about seeing, that he's, this is where the visitor comes into the house and sees the changeling okay. and this is often where, where the idea that 
it's the it's the it's the visitor who notes that the strange nature of the of this child mm. uh, and confirms to the parents that's not your child that's a changeling so child that hadn't grown up at eight or nine it was still uh, the appearance of a child of about 12 months the people were out in the fields working this day and a neighbor woman went in it usually stopped in the cradle well the kitchen was the usual country kitchen there was a table and a dresser but to her amazement when she went in the child that should have been in the cradle was up on the dresser where there was a pot of honey as soon as she came in through the door the child jumped on the floor and into the cradle again the explanation of that is it was a changeling the baby the original genuine baby was taken away and this creature substituted and put in its place so there's a strange substitute creature put in the place of this healthy child, basically. This is the, the, <clears throat> the premise that you find time and time again. And as you were saying, once it's banished by burning it or killing it or whatever, um, the question of how the original child is returned is often a bit kind of vague and, and odd. I've, I've, so. I've read, I've heard instances that these were as simple as, you know, an old lady appeared at the back door and just kind of flung the child back into the house and, and then that was it. Um, but this basic fear that kind of, you know, again, that, that this isn't your child anymore, that something has gone horribly wrong and yeah, it's particularly kind of it's a dark and strange it's terrifying, idea. It is, really? and some of the some of the motifs and the images of, of um, like the figure of the stock that we'll talk about later on, maybe or this the, the, this kind of lifeless withered stick that's that that's left that's left at the in end. place. Yeah, at the end, yeah. Um, but I suppose a lot a lot of the the kind of the figures, the nineteenth century literary figures, were interested in in changelings, and we have some accounts of changing lore from um, the likes of um, Wentz. Evan, Evan, Evans Wensley wrote, wrote The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. He was usually influenced by people like Yeats and stuff like that. Or um, Lady Gregory and, and others. Um, Wentz, in, in his book, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, which I advise people to get, it's, it's a nice book, in 1911, he said that, in many such cases, there's an undoubted belief expressed by the parents and friends that fairy possession has taken place. And then, on, on account of this possession, a banishment had to take place uh, in order to kind of restore their situation to order. It's also interesting with the changeling that this is a kind of, I was thinking about this yesterday, that often with the fairy host you have these disruptive kind of interruptions that flash into people's lives where people are whisked away or have this other world experience or their world journey that they then come back from. But these things happen on the periphery. You have, say, um, fairy winds travelling across the land over the horizon in while people are working in the fields. Yeah. Or you have things like the stray sod where you step on an enchanted spot of earth and you're, and you're sent astray or you get lost. Or you have the fairy path which kind of cuts across the, the land as a supernatural kind of uh, pathway or arc or whatever. All these items that are at the edge and the periphery of, of kind of normal life. Whereas this, as an interruption, is one that's right in the centre of the home. It's in the cradle, it's by the fire. It's that kind of disorder that, that, that I suppose it affects the husband, the wife, the child, the family at its at its the core. The sacred unit, really. Yeah, yes, yeah. so it's it's really, really, it's kind of, it's a it's a, um, a dark, unpleasant disorder which affects the family unit, the, the 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 kind of a site which should be that of total safety and order. The home basically is is um, is filled with uh, rank disarray and disorder, basically, and that's the kind of the, the fear that comes into these sorts of things. Um, I was laughing at this from Lady Gregory, where she she describes kind of even the idea that non-conformist behaviour in an individual could lead them to being labelled as a changeling or being in the fairies in some way. Mm-hmm. And this quote from Lady Gregory sounds like off actually uh, quite a number of friends of mine. It says, um, I don't know what's wrong with my son unless he's a real regular pagan. He lies in the bed most of the day and he won't go out till evening and he won't go to mass. And he has a memory for everything he ever heard or read. I never knew the like. Most people forget what they read in a book within one year after. I have some friends in particular who would fit who would fit uh, quite tightly with that description, I would say. Um, another fella... We've spoken about the defamatory statement, shall we? Have. No, no, that's, that's praise. Softly. That's high, high praise. <laughs> I meant actual um, praise. Um, another fella, Edward Sidney Hartland, who, who, who contributed to the Folklore Society in England, and he was the mayor of Gloucester in 1902 for his troubles, he said that the changings he had met were invariably deformed or diseased, uh, and he described one as an idiot of forbidding aspect, uh, a dark, tawny complexion, and much addicted to screaming. So there were these kind of, I suppose, attempts to define and describe um, changings with reference to ailments and illnesses at the time, but also the sense that, like he'd read there, like, oh, the changings I met were all like this, that they were believed in quite flatly, you know, that this, birth, this child is a changeling. True. 
it was just interesting picking up on that point and um, so we've probably been kind of reading some of the similar um sources but some of those early i suppose official civic and legal records that jumped out at me mm. I, was, I was quite surprised that they would appear in these sources when i kind of associate it so much with the folklore canon but certain others i've got 10 here but um, i might just share these across social media during the week mm. so that you can people can follow up are these court cases yeah these mm. where they appear so say for example you've got um where are we so there's a 1690 Swedish court case detailing a prosecution brought against a man and a woman for leaving a 10-year-old changeling on a manure heap overnight on Christmas Eve, hoping for the return of their own real child hmm. in the apostrophes. But tragically, the child died of exposure. Then you've got, later in the 18th century, you've got what are called the Kirk Poor Records in Scotland, where certain recipients of poor support or what we be call relief funds were noted down and in the remarks sections so if you imagine these big tomes of um, binders ledgers. with names the ledgers that's the word I'm looking for and um, by their names they actually had the word changeling in remarks hmm. <laughs> and then you've got where was the other one I found interesting do, do, do. yeah you've got court cases appearing between the 1850s and 1900s in Germany Scandinavia Great Britain hmm. and in Ireland obviously the most noted would be Bridget Cleary mm. in 1895. Now she was slightly different in that she was 26, a woman who was believed by her husband to have been taken away yeah. um, by the fairies and a changeling left in her place and she was ultimately tortured and killed, um, killed and, and burned. Buried in a bog. Yeah, just tragic. And when you think that 1895 is not that mm. long ago, realistically. But I mean, wasn't this, uh, I'm not familiar particularly with, with the, the details of that case, but was it not kind of suggested in parts that that the husband and others who were involved with her murder kind of they they utilized a thin veneer of you know traditional kind of mm. lore to actually just murder one might torture and murder her. but how they dealt with it in the court case what amazed me was that they were prosecuted for manslaughter as opposed to murder mm. because it was accepted that the mens rea which is certain criminal acts need various um components to Ten, substantiate murder is intent, exactly whatever, yeah. so you need the mental element and you need the physical element of the act the mm. act and so the mens rea wasn't there because the court was of the opinion that they really believed um, what mm. they were doing was to restore her restore her Bizarre. and to banish this change. Yeah, it's a dark, that's a particularly dark case. Um, so again, um, quite curious to see where history and folklore interact there. But do you want mm. your pub quiz question for Go the, for for the day? Yeah. I love this. So there was a Swedish writer called Selma Lagerlof. Mm. I'm probably um, brutalizing that name. But Selma Lagerlof, worth looking up. And she wrote a book in 1915 called Trolloc Maniscor. Again, brutalizing that. But it was later translated as The Changeling. So she wrote that in 1915. But a few years earlier, in 1909, she won the Nobel Prize for Literature. The very first woman ever to win mm. it. So that's your pub quiz question. That'll do. That'll Selma do. Lagerlof. Um, did you... I, I remember reading somewhere... First of all, with the, the dung heap thing that you mentioned, in, was that in Sweden? Sweden. I remember, I don't know that we played in the podcast, but I've definitely heard Seamus McPhillip, she, no, Seamus McPhillip, um, Sean McHenry from Northwest Mayo, from Carew Hoig, Carew and the Gluck, that beautiful part of, of um, the west of Ireland. He's an amazing storyteller and, and bearer of tradition himself, but um, he gave an account on about Ethan the Shulodi, the, the, which he meant Halloween night. Uh, where these spirits are all kind of walking around and, and he mentions I think the changelings kind of wandering about and such but that a girl would often be put out um, on the dung heap or on, out of the house praying for an hour and then she'd be able to come back in there was some strange reference to it like exactly like you mentioned there just at the top of my head like to, to the, check it out to the carnelian like the actual dung heap I think there's something there's some reference to that yeah, that she had to sit out and pray for about an hour um, and then could kind of come back in I can't remember. I'll have to find that out. But the other, the other strange thing as well, you know, w was that even there are instances of, um, I think it might have been in, might have been in Iceland. I'm not entirely sure. In the 1600s, a woman was executed, having given birth to a deformed child with a kind of deformed and mangled skull mm -hmm. with some disease, because there's an idea that that some kind of consortment with the evil one has occurred or something yeah, like that. That's or, a hybrid. or the, the Puritans, the, the good old Puritans are always good for good for a laugh. Um, in 1642, there was some, I think a farmhand or something, that, who, who was executed, he was put to death because a, a sow gave birth to a one-eyed piglet mm. and, and he was accused of having consorted with the devil. And so that the idea was that, well, you know, you've done this and you need, now you need to 
be executed just because you were there when this thing was born or whatever. So that was very um, common though, those two threads of belief that it was either a result of the thoughts or the actions of the person of the of the pregnant woman i.e. the mother yeah. i.e. the woman always to blame Ech. Oh, and then and or so it would either be her fault um or considered a supernatural intervention yes, that was the, the often the, the, two threads. the idea that the mother was blighted and that she had she had basically she, she, there was some sort of supernatural retribution and she was being punished for this sort of thing um what was the, the notion the hair lip if mm. a woman saw hair that in tradition it was told that she should tear her garment some bit of her garment so that the tear would not affect the child. It would it would be gone. It would kind of have found its its way out, if you if you know what I mean. It would have been kind of leveled. There's no death there, or whatever. Um, but there are other instances as well that if the or or the, the idea that if a woman was ungenerous or cruel, mm. that her child would be born with no mouth and yes. stuff like this. That that oh, the thoughts the thoughts of of the individual expressed themselves kind of um, I suppose later on. There's um another little piece here. It's very brief, but it's kind of it's a nice little piece from. Um, her own, I think it's only 15 seconds long, giving an account of, of uh, the fairies leaving a little witch in place of the child and that if it sneezes, the people say, God bless the child for fear you're a witch or something like that. Here we are. When the fairies were on the go, they used to take little children away and leave a, leave a witch in his place. And when the child used to sneeze at him, they would say, God bless you, child, for fear you're a witch. This, that was uh, from County Tyrone, again, it was 1953. Um, and it's what? funny that you, you, it's a nice segue, as if we'd planned it. Nice. Because when he says um, to, to say bless you, mm. it's one of the great protections. Mm -hmm. And so it might be a nice way to lead us into the top tips for expecting Protect, parents. Protecting yourself. Protecting yourself and mm -hmm. your child. Or one of the most common ones that I would have um, known is the use of, of iron often mm -hmm. as a protecting kind of power. In fact, it's very strange, but yeah, that iron <clears throat> in folk tradition is able to banish the supernatural. But one of the most common things you'd see maybe would be the placing of the tongs of the fire over the cradle. Mm. Um, because it meant, I suppose, that the fairies were unable to, to access the child. They couldn't pass this barrier. Fire and iron, it's the, great, the two fire great and iron. protections, isn't Excellent. it? Excellent. Um, and further to that, then sometimes a red flannel being left. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there's a p I have a piece here that relates in some way to that. This was This woman here is talking about She's from Transkey, just beside the university here in County Dublin. But she's talking about her mother, and her mother's people came from County Cavan in the Midlands, uh, not together, more supernatural county. And uh, the, there's water being thrown out of the house at night. And one of the common beliefs as, as far as the throwing out of, of dirty water from the house at night was that you need to be careful, you can't just throw it out, you need to give, warning. give a warning so that the dead or the fairies as they pass by won't be soaked and duly kind of frustrated by the water that you've just thrown over them. Um, but she mentions changelings in this account, and I think it's at the end of this that she asks about uh, the red flannel, but she receives a negative answer, but still. You were telling me too about them throwing out the water at night. Oh, that's my mother, Lord of Mercy, no? That was my Aunt Mary. I never remember her. It was only a baby. And she was um, having the baby eight months old. She had to keep it clean. Four o'clock of a... In January, it happened, or February, I don't know. It was just in the starting of the season because my father died the first or sixth of January or something and so after that she went down mm -hmm. so she's washing and then she went throw out the water and my aunt Mary said Martha don't throw out that water asked she what age and Mary says no one out there it's fine and clear you don't know now she she might be someone passing I have done my eyes to see someone passing she said to her the good people will be passing she she don't do it Martha my mother got frightened. She came home immediately. Yeah. Took me up and went off. Was this the fairies they meant? Good people. I couldn't tell what they meant. That's what they called them. Anyhow, the good people. Yeah. Oh, Did they used to believe in all that rubbish at that time. That if you put a child in the cradle, the fairies would take it and put some other child there. Where, did they, where was this? In County Cavan? Well, it's supposed to be, but my mother didn't believe that. Did like you ever that. hear of them putting things in the cradle to protect the child? No. Like red flannel or... No, no. So, yeah, tongs, cradles, needles, needle in the child's uh, christening garment if it has been taken from the house. Mm. Hide a little needle in the sleeve. Ah, oh, for protection. So that it, it can't be messed with. Um, but I have it written in my notes here. Tongs, cradles, needles, Catherine. Oh, your, your yes. Your friend, Catherine. Didn't That's true, because christening? she did, because you know I always like to do a little bit of a focus group Excellent, yeah. for our podcast. So um, my very dear friend Catherine had a little baby boy, Cahal, last year. Actually, he'll be nearly a year old um, next month. 
I think this is how, this is how I'll discover that I'm getting older as he grows. Mm-hmm. First day of school, mm-hmm. confirmation, university, and I'm like, oh, I'm eighty. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> but um, I asked Catherine actually when Cal was born if she undertook any protection or uh, kind of activities mm-hmm. to protect him in any way that kind of connected in with tradition. And interestingly enough, most of them were religious. And I suppose kind of the more common ones now, but those that I noted down were as follows. She put holy medals and coins in under his cot. She blessed the cot with water from Fatima. We're big believers in the holy water in Donegal. Um, she had, oh yeah, she kept him inside until she got him christened for the most part because she actually kind of felt a nervousness about going out. Um, but I suppose when he wasn't christened. When he wasn't, I, I don't know whether it was that necessarily because I didn't kind of probe her too much she had things to do as a young mother johnny Mm -hmm. she didn't have time to be ranting to me but um she was quite kind of i suppose maybe that's a first born as well but she got him christened very early and she had prayers said as well which is obviously very common and what was the other thing oh yeah she had a lovely thing where his baptism gown was made from the material of her communion dress Mm. which i thought was lovely so it's funny that there are still observances as we as we often see in various times of the year mm-hmm. and at various kind of rites of passage where we still observe these kind of comforting traditions mm, and beliefs. Uh, it relates, I suppose, to the most important aspects and the most vulnerable and fragile um, aspects of life that we attach this symbolic and abstract importance to and, and methods of protecting ourselves. And even although there's a kind of, I suppose you could frame some of those protections in the context of, of Christian or Catholic tradition within it, you'll actually find, I would think, that if, if you're to, if you're, you won't find um, instructions to these sorts of things in, in canon law texts. No. And you'd often find that some of the, the aspects of the church hierarchy actually would look very dimly on these practices that on one hand are regarded as being kind of um, Catholic in a sense, but even the idea of burying items under something or in something, whatever, they, they prefigure and predate um, that particular framework of belief say you know but they then take it on it's, it's that kind of paganism peeping out from behind catholicism you know and, and these little practices especially the apocryphal religious traditions which often resonate with me in that where you have um a kind of i don't know you have these aspects of 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 pre-christian and christian tradition kind of floating alongside one another um in a strange panoply really of these kind of customs but but it's not it's not at all uncommon and and you can see again it's this is this is where folk tradition kind of comes into it, it deals with those, like I was saying a minute ago, those, those most important aspects or those, those apparently weak or vulnerable kind of parts of our lives that are particularly precious, which operate like a hinge in, in a person's life, this kind of weak point around which everything turns and attached to which are this enormous kind of body of, of traditional belief and, and uh, uh, yeah, ways to ward off evil, basically. Mm-hmm. And the iron, the iron is a strange and interesting um, aspect in the connection with the, the blacksmith and stuff as well. Actually, if a piece brief piece here which I'll play about it's a kind of it's a strange and slightly disjointed account it gives an account of a woman who dies um, and then there's a blacksmith walking around the road and he meets a funeral coming and the tradition all over the country is when you meet a funeral coming on the road since you would be walking you turn around if you're coming the opposite direction to it you turn around and walk three steps with it and then you can walk on your way but he, he does the three steps and I think he, he bears the coffin for, for a second or something like that and it falls down and the woman steps out it alive um, and then there's a kind of a reference to her having a changeling in the house. It's a slightly bizarre one, but it just references this question of the smith and the mm. connection with kind of iron and so on. I'll play this. Well, I heard my uncle telling about a woman who lived in Ferenjalt and she died at childbirth. People were all very sorry and she had a very large funeral. And they were burying out at Bedoni at that time. So when they were going out through Barnes Gap, they met a smith on the road. He had some hammers in his pocket and steel. So of course he turned back and gave the usual three steps and said he would give a bit of a carriage to the coffin. So he pulled the hammers and steel out of his pocket and threw it on top of the coffin to help, uh, to make it handier. And just as he did, the coffin went to the ground and the woman stepped out of the coffin and walked home with him. And when she came home, the child was continuously crying, continuously crying. So she went to some neighbor woman to consult her about the child. And she told her 
to put it in a basket and put it over the fire to see what would happen. So she got a basket, put the child over the fire, and the child went up in the smoke and was never heard of after. And the woman lived for 10 years herself. So, he just said so matter, matter of factly. Mm. Just but again, the, it's the blacksmith puts his, his iron or steel or his tools on top of the coffin and then it disenchants this woman who's not really dead, it seems. So there's a strange kind of uh, aspect of that particular narrative. But uh, And again, you know, yeah, it's a kind of, so, you know, he said, put her in, put the child in the fire yeah, and he'll go up in the smoke. And so this is this is kind of what occurs. But um, there's, there's a kind of poem from 1612, Albion's England, and it says, Sea fairies who into their beds did foist your babes and theirs exchanged to be. So there's this idea that, again, that the fairies are kind of, putting their, their swapping creatures basically into your cradle and they're taking your healthy child away. If you're not watching. And so the b- belief careful, is yeah. that you should be absolutely vigilant over your child for the first three days mm. up until six weeks apparently. And that could be quite arbitrary. This is just what I've read. But um, that there is this belief that you have to be on your guard for those first few days and mm. few weeks. Which is funny to me because I looked up yesterday what the maternity leave in Ireland is and it's 26 weeks, so I think we're okay. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting as well, the period, kind of the six-week period. I wonder if it in some way relates, or corresponds in a sense to the 40-day cycle as well, which, mm. which features in different religions and different traditions of all sorts. And the idea that, yeah. that the child being born is subject or kind of, I suppose, exposed to these uh, supernatural forces that, are, that it can't ward off or whatever. And then it needs to be, you need to be particularly kind of prevalent and careful. Uh, in protecting it there's another piece that reminds me of that this woman is described she has a dream and she she, this is as far as i recall her an account of a memory where she's saying this happened to me i think i could be around there but um she describes having had a bad dream where one of the children die um and she on account of this terrible dream she stays up all through the night and just as dawn is breaking she hears something bang outside the front of the house and when she looks outside um she realised a dead duck is there in front, at the front door and it was the fairies basically who, who have basically, they were going to take oh, the child and leave this dead this dead kind of duck as, a, as an image in place of the child basically. Um, but uh, except for her staying awake for the night. Any stories about children being taken by fairies? I don't know. I don't know. I heard it, but I told it to, to, Michael. to Michael there before too. But... My grandmother dreamed oh. dream that it was one of the children sick. Mm-hmm. She dreamt that it was going to die, the night. Yeah. And she sat up the whole night. And like that too, the coach began to kill her. Oh, they did. They did, but she never went out. Mm-hmm. Never opened the door. And she heard her saying, I just had the brick a day, just when day was breaking, there was a shot let outside the door. Oh, no. And she still didn't open, not till the sun rose. Oh. And when she sun rose, up, she opened the door, and there was a big duck dead outside in the social flat. That's what they meant to live in the place of the tree. The duck? Ah, the duck. Hmm. Ah. Mm-hmm. Did she save? She saved the tree. Right. She did, surely. So you hear all this kind of, there's banging and it's all through the night, and she's like, won't go out, doesn't go near the door. And then at break of day, you're able to go outside. That was the, the boundary, so when the world swaps back and now it's now it's human time as opposed to the supernatural kind of time or whatever and even thinking about doors and windows it's mm. all boundaries as yes even yeah 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 it's, it's really interesting there was yeah. another disturbing um piece that i heard and i thought i'd i'd um i'd i'd, t- I'd edit the audio but i didn't but or i thought i had it for the podcast but uh, a woman is describing um she's in bed and the child is at the foot of the bed in the cradle and she feels herself being dragged away by the, the fairies and she can feel that she's being taken and that she, there's something she can do and now she's being dragged out of the bed uh, in this kind of strange feverish state or whatever she, she grabs her husband's flannel and she holds on to it with all her, all her might until eventually um, she feels this power beginning to wane and that's taking her away and she's, she, she remains there she survives this thing basically but it's the idea that it's the, the, the fairies have come into the house they're trying to take her away uh, but the flannel kept her there and it was sometimes there, there's reference to the idea where where with reference to a man's garment, it, it can be kind of, there's some sort of safety. Like there was the woman who, uh, when the child was just born, she had her husband's um, mucky old boots at the end of the bed. And it was asked why, and she explained that, that the fairies wouldn't wouldn't try and take her or the child with these boots there. They were kind of protected from it. 
So there's the element of the, the husband and wife in that sort of sense. And that's not an excuse for you to leave your dirty boots stuff everywhere. the house. Well, look, that's just, I'm covering, um, <laughs> oh, I'm just hedging my bets. Um, and the other idea, I suppose, that's common as well is the, the idea that they come through the window mm-hmm. often. And there's, well, there's a legend we'll look at, in, I suppose, in a wee bit about that particular legend. But as I was saying earlier, I suppose, it's an introduction that comes into the heart of the of the home. And um, and this changeling, I suppose, is is... is is foisted into your into your care for want of a better word um would it go through some some descriptions of the changeling i think so because it's a, a huge component of each mm. of the narrative the descriptions and how they vary i was surprised to learn just well actually not really surprised but i suppose it was pleasant at least just the amount of names by which the changeling was known there's a list of i'll just run through them here and um, it's about 30 or 40 different names in tradition the enchanted lad this is just in Ireland. The Enchanted Lad, a dummy, a good for nothing, Sowelt, Pasha de Hivesha, Buchel Border, Splieta, Fehede, Tasha, the Image, Summa Old Anashore, Demon, a leaving of the good people, a curious child, strange creature, ugly bony man, Bantling, a queer child, a different child, a small withered child, a spirit, Shan Violador, which is interesting, old fiddler, oh. just preserve his. But that will make sense uh, later when we talk will. about his skills. Uh, a black thing, an old monkey, an old fashioned codger. Drochrod, or just a bad thing, Pasht Grane, a substitute, Mahanach, or weakling, Kankron, and Kratachon, a little kind of emaciated creature. So there's oh, all sorts I, of... And I came across one which I found really interesting, because it's Yerlish, that we call it here in the archives sometimes, Yerlish, yeah. and Shifra. Yes. It was very, I had a friend very, called Shifra I, was gonna say, I remember um, Dahi Hogan saying that he didn't understand why people called their the children, children Shifra, because yeah. it, it means kind of, I suppose, the supernatural remains left by the fairies. Mm. It's like a means changing. True. And one Bizarre. Of the, but it, what got me as well... Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a not unpopular girl's name. Yeah, and every chief I know has been lovely. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the things that caught my attention was in Scotland, they're known as... Now, I'm going to spell this. It's T-A-F-O-D-C-H-A-R-A-N. So... Tahran or something? Tahran. Mm-hmm. But what's really interesting to me, in Donegal, we call a child a Tahran. Like really? Call it you know. No, no way. Yeah. Mad. To me, we can't all be changed things. No. But yeah, that's the Irish word we use mm. for, for child in Donegal, Weird. Tahran. Yeah. And then there's a description even, you know, of kind of uh, you know, a mm. kind of a person with God as in for someone who's touched, quote unquote. These kind of notions that there's some sort of supernatural association with a, with a child who is different. Uh, different or not quite right, as it were. Yeah. Uh, some of the descriptions as well about the changing that in Wicklow, there was a count saying that the changing wouldn't eat any Christian food, quote unquote, whatever that is. It said it tore up roots and ate them like a dog and others would eat a pot of pigs feeding. Or there's already pigs slop, and there's one instance it was described when he was eating at night, um, and then some accounts was described the changing as being unable to walk. Then others would say he could walk two months. Uh, others spent years in the cradle by the fire without growing or developing at all. It was a piece from County Antrim, in the north of Ireland. It says there was a man in this district called Clark, and he was supposed to be a sickly elf left by the fairies. They say he smoked and carried on like a big body when he was wee. He was a very odd man. They say the fairies left him plenty of money. So the fairies, obviously, he was kind of, I don't know, gave him some sort of compensation for his troubles, it <laughs> seem. Um, and the body as well is a strange one, but the body is often described as kind of being misshapen, wizened, looking like an old man, mm, having a beard, back. crooked back. Yeah. In Germany, they have a big fat head and a fat neck, um, long teeth. Mm. Um, yeah, there's a variety of descriptions, but none of which generally are kind of pleasant. And it's, and it's, it's generally a male. Yes, changeling. yes. Um, Seamus McPhillip actually looked at, I think, 490 versions. Ne- versions. And of those, he only had about 70, I think, he found that had girls as being the, the newborn child. Mm. But, yeah. But is it true? No, I don't know. I've read this, but I would need, you know, um, pediatric professionals to tell me that yes. boys, <laughs> that's you, Johnny, mm-hmm. that um, boys were more susceptible to certain apparently um, they are, to congenital, congenital disorders. disorders. Yeah, apparently, apparently so. Oh, interesting. Um, a great deal more so than women, apparently, yeah, realized. as a genetic you know, malformity or whatever. And I guess you have to consider as well rates of infant mortality, mm. um, forms of infanticide, I suppose, as being kind of not uncommon, really, in the past. I mean, if you look back, even I was reading a while ago, there's a nice little book, The Greek View of Life, and uh, the mention of the, the Spartan tradition, you know, and what they'd do when, when a child was born, they'd examine it for, for, you know, malformities or deformities, whatever, and if it was viewed as being some sort of kind of a weakling, whatever, it was left mm-hmm. on a on a hillside to die, and they just they cast all these all these creatures there. So, but then you see, even the UCD Cultural Heritage Unit has a blog that's really interesting. Each of the four cultural heritage units mm. posts 
a piece every fortnight so it's worth looking up but our colleagues two weeks ago wrote about the foundling hospital in dublin Mm -hmm. which is this 19th century i believe institution where they would have been found across ireland where these children would have been left that were abandoned now some of those may have been abandoned simply because they couldn't have been looked after although they were perfectly healthy but i imagine some of these children would have been those who suffered from illnesses and Mm, certain disabilities Mm -hmm. and just the levels of mortality were shocking in these places where you'd have in a year that i'm very much paraphrasing here but if Mm. you had say twenty thousand children being brought in in a year you'd have eighteen thousand that would die or something Mm. like they were shockingly high but this is representative and even William Wilde, Oscar Wilde's hmm. father, who acted as a commissioner for the census in 18... 1851. 1851, 61 and 71, or was it 41, 51? Certainly around the 1850s. Just a report from 51 or something, yeah. I think so. And he noted the, the mortality rates and the kind of illnesses amongst children at that time mm. were just unacceptably high. Mm. But we hadn't really kind of come to the advent of modern medicine yet. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, yeah, he mentions that tub- tubercular and other diseases having contributed to to belief in the changeling mm. but the the the, the i guess was the body is generally described as being very ugly mm. uh, and kind of odd or as a characteristic of being somewhat elderly even though the person is a kind of a newborn or infant the other strange one uh, is the stock that is left mm. which is this kind of lifeless stick as the life force wanes from from the from the the the, the creature that's been left it, it just a, a stick is left behind or whatever this kind of empty item or whatever there's an account i have here of um an individual where the the this couple have um this well the, ch- the child is, is not their own they believe it's a changeling and the priest comes and he he prays over the child um and when he comes down they go upstairs and there's just a stick left in the bed basically well, was there ever any word here of the 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 fairies taking people away well it was it was a usual chat around the fireside long oh. and it's a down what to do? There was one, I was, I was, about, I was 10 years of age when my brother brought me over to, it's uh, one city, Kilty Clogher, it's in Fermanagh, it's on the border. And uh, he took me to speak the 11 months. Now, this is one incident, any of, it's supposed a uh, child to be taken away with the fairies. So, there was an old house right be, beside the mid, for our work with. And like all youngsters, I was very inquisitive and to know what was inside. And I looked in on the window and I seen chairs and tables and delf and everything left there the same as it the water and the roof half hanging in. No one no one had ventured into it. There was a little girl at twelve years and uh, she got sick. And they didn't know what was wrong with her. And uh, the doctor come to her. They couldn't find out what. She was there in the bed all was lamenting and moaning. And when they used to go out, when they used to leave her in the bed. But they used to come back in, they thought they had a runner from the kitchen. Yes. Right back into the bed and her moaning away. And uh, God, the, the priest come to it anyway. And the priest was in the room. But he went out and he wouldn't give them much knowledge. So this night she got very bad and the father went for the priest. And the priest said, kind of put his head out the window, it says two o'clock in the night. And he wasn't going to come out, he said. So the fellow gave him, he wasn't pleased with him. Well, he says, I'll go, he says, and I'll let you know if you are caring or not. So I come and he went up to the room and she was moaning there and the, he prayed to leave the sweat fell off. And he come down and went up and all was in the bed was a rotten stick. So there were the name, a family, the name of Gallagher. This was told to me for truth from my brother's mother-in-law. Yeah. They went to America. No one ever, they never sold a thing for them, and the, they never come back. Now the girl was not, never heard her, never seen nothing more. Oh. And that was now, that was told to me by this old woman. She was, she was uh, Mrs. Rooney, she was uh, Gilmartin herself, yes. Mary Gilmartin. And that happened in her day. Yes. So mm-hmm. now... Yeah. So that's the stick being left after the, after the priest's prayer over it. But um, so, I suppose the description of the varying forms, the change can take it in a variety of different forms. Um, but to carry on, I suppose there's a piece here from the folklore of the Isle of Man. From the, this is published in 1891, and again, so this this 
tradition that we're talking we're looking at examples from, from Irish tradition but it very much ties into the folklore of, of Britain and Ireland and of Scandinavia and Northwest Europe at, and Europe at large but basically particularly the Celtic cultures and, and Germanic as well yeah that, that's it's kind of linked into these these these, um, these traditions so it's part of our I suppose uh, communal branch of, of traditional inheritance whatever but this piece it says the story of infants uh, being exchanged in their cradles is here in such credit that mothers are in continual terror of the thought of it I was prevailed upon to go and see a child who they told me was of these changelings and indeed must own I was not a little surprised as well as shocked at the sight nothing under heaven could have a more beautiful face but though between five and six years old and seemingly healthy he was so far from being able to walk or stand that he could not so much as move only one any one joint his limbs were vastly long for his age but smaller than an infant of six months uh, his complexion was perfectly delicate and he had the finest hair in the world he never spoke or cried or ate scarce anything and very seldom seemed to smile but if anyone ever called him a fairy elf he would frown and fix his eyes so earnestly on those who said it as if he would look them through the neighbours out of curiosity have often looked down at the window to see how he behaved when alone which whenever they did they were sure to find him laughing and in the utmost delight this made them judge that he was not without company more pleasing to him than any mortals could be and what made this conjecture seem the more reasonable was that if he were left ever so dirty the woman at her return saw him with a clean face his hair combed with the utmost exactness and nicety so that's the isle of man 1891 um, but what's suggested i suppose for that piece apart from the physical description is the the temperament the mind of the changing which is often described as being kind of he's often described as you know an idiot or can't speak or whatever but in other instances the narrative is kind of moves towards a resolution when the changing actually is very witty mm. and reveals uh, great his, insight and knowledge. Yeah, there was accounts like that he could he could talk on uh, any subject like a learned old man and stuff like this, and is that the changing gives its age away by often when it sees something ridiculous being done and it says like oh I've seen um, the acorn grow to the oak but I've never seen so something so stupid in all my life so when the someone starts brewing in eggshells or they, they do something silly, basically, or the changing things they're alone and asks for a smoke of a pipe or whatever. And it's the being unobserved is a common motif yeah. that he mm. believes himself to be alone or mm -hmm. that no one's looking and that he'll either speak to if he has a twin there with him or mm. he'll ask the tailor who's there, hand me down those pipes and he plays the most beautiful music, mm. um, as you said, revealing his great age. So that I saw that lake when it was a stream or... Yeah. I remember the battle of, you know, 1259. Uh, Moitura, Ka Ka there's one reference mm. where the changeling, I think it's in, in Connemara or something, where it references the, the battle of Moitura, where um, the Thuhi the Danan kind of vanquished the four Morians mm. and the fair bullock, these supernatural races that, that prefigure the existence of humans on, on the, this island, basically. So and this changeling sits up and, and, and describes his memory of this battle. So the mind is often kind of described, on one hand, as being idiotic and kind of, uh, dumb and stupid and then and, and in addition to that being particularly witty and intelligent um, and giving itself away by that sense and it's, it's that kind of benign attempt to trick them to revealing that great age that's one of the great components of the narratives mm. so that if you placed pipes beside them mm -hmm. or a fiddle and that's where your the old fiddler comes mm. in because and our professor Rina Yoga in his wonderful article on music learned from yeah. the fairies where we know that they're incredibly gifted musicians and so one of the ways perhaps to trick them into revealing their form as a changeling was to give them pipes or give them fiddles mm. because there's one tale where she describes Garrett Barry, a famous piper, where he just plays this wonderful tune and this changeling sits up and says, ah, you're good, but I've heard better. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's um, those are more humorous, I suppose, motifs than the the harsher treatment it's a, it's a part of it where, where the yeah the changing is then fully revealed as being not everything is not as it seems mm. and that's then what allows um, for it to be banished once there's been a certain confirmation that this in fact is a changing it can then be banished and hopefully the child returned one hopes one hopes um, but yeah i suppose the common the other the other kind of instance that was often described is that when when you know it's a changeling um is to run inside and say that such and such a fairy hill is on fire which is the common thing and uh, and that the, the changing would then rise up in the bed and say oh my god my wife my children and all my entire estate and good grief and, and flies out of the house yeah. thinking that its actual home is is ablaze or is, is on fire so and one of the interesting things just to finish up as well with what you were saying earlier tying in with the iron and the blacksmith there was this idea of the skill that the 
changeling was skilled in um, smith work and so one story yes. shows the spade, the spade. Yeah, yeah. so there's a, a tailor or a blacksmith who comes to visit the house and he has a spade and when the mother is out the changeling says to your man oh you know you need to see about that spade there's a crack in, there's a crack spade. in it so when the tailor goes or the blacksmith goes to look at it or speaks to a professional blacksmith and says um is there anything wrong with the spade and he's like my God, don't trust that child because only a true blacksmith oh, yeah, would, would, have seen this would have known this, this hairline crack, crack in it. Anything, yeah. And so then they realise, oh Lord, it's a changeling. And so he goes back to tell the mother to take protective Beat measures. it over the head with the spade. <laughs> yeah. There's um, one piece before we go, which we didn't really, but I wanted to, to have. This is the woman describing the fairies trying to take the child out the window, um, which is a kind of common motif. And then you might have, well, a we one of the traditional prayers Perfect. used to protect individuals from these things. There was an old lady in Killian told me she was minding her niece during her confinement. She was sleeping in a bed where there was a blind window. She caught the child the, the gentlefolk. where the gentlefolk were taking it through the window and took it back and put it in its cradle. So, we are under constant threat from interruptions from the supernatural and must be on our guard. But there a are, good there guide are, um, life. Yes. <laughs> but there are, there's um, a lovely little book, if anyone's interested, Our Baltrach Duchish, Our Traditional Prayers, which just has a list of traditional prayers in Irish from all over the country on every little topic, like lighting the fire, turning out the light, getting up in the morning, doing work after being sick, visiting a house where there's a disease and it, all sorts of huge lists of things. But within that, there's a section on, on putting a child to sleep, prayers to protect them. And I, I quite like this, although it's just to put the child to sleep, I think it, it covers a multitude. So I'm going to dedicate this to Cahal. May he have a long, healthy, happy life. May he indeed. And may he be safe always, and his family. So this is Lelin Yanu Bahar Hawa. Gia de the Vanu Alinu, Karam Hu or Yin Wee Gusimek, or Yin Rija Gusabrech, Gus or Yin Jay the Janarth. Which is basically saying, um, May God bless you, child. I put you under the protection of Mary and her son. Um, and St. Bridget and her cloth, which again was considered a great protection for children mm. and under God's um, kind of roof or God's mm. protection tonight. Mm -hmm. That'll do us. I suppose, uh, well, we shall almost leave it there. I would hope also that um, Mikahal perhaps might also have the good fortune to learn some music off the fairies as they are so gifted in this regard. I'm going to finish with a piece from the archive. This is by Mickey Doherty, um, a fellow from Donegal. Oh, excellent. Of one of your own. Perfect. Very well chosen. And this is a jig learnt off the fairies, and he gives a brief account of, um, of well, basically of, of just that. So we'll finish with this this piece, um, and bid you adieu until next month. And well, stay safe, I suppose. Slán libh ar Slán. This is a jig that has been learned off the fairies, and tillen. I heard my uncle Mickey saying that there was a man learned it off the fairies. He was a Mickey McConnell. I uh, heard him saying that before he died, that's about 30 years ago. So he used to play it himself on the fiddle. <laughs>